you are helping so much. I, you have no idea. Um, all right. So bone tissue um, is what we're going to be talking about. And it looks like I have my little toolsies and whatnot down here, which is nice. I am going to switch into tablet mode, though, just because it's so much easier for me to draw when I have that going on versus the classical laptop mode. So in the inset, because I don't know how to get rid of it, in the inset, you're just going to see the ceiling. Sorry. All right. So I actually want to talk about the approach to this first, if I can. No, I can't go back. Cool. All right. Only going forward. This is already turning out to be a very cruddy version of record. Doesn't matter though. So we're doing chapter six, bone tissue. So one thing I do want to point out to all of you is that it's bone tissue. So if you look at the reading schedule in the syllabus, you'll notice that the chapters, the actual anatomy chapters of your textbook that concern things like, you know, listing the bones of the appendicular skeleton and telling you about all of the bony features that make up the appendicular skeleton, those kinds of things. I actually don't require that you read those chapters because there is nothing drier and more boring than reading anatomy aloud. Anatomy is really for looking at stuff. So if you're wondering like, where are those chapters? Why aren't they here? That's why. So because lecture is focused on physiology, which is the how things work, um, bone tissue takes on lots of shapes. which you're beginning to learn in lab, but all of those different and varied shapes have their ultimate tissue structure in common. So you looked at osteons and concentric lamellae and osteocytes and all of that good stuff on the histology slides. Um, so that was compact bone. So all of the bone tissue is basically a combo of compact bone and what is called spongy or trabecular bone. So in this lecture, basically what we're going to talk about is what's in there, what it's made out of, and also the types of ossification. So before you had a fully formed skeleton, what did you have instead of that? And how did you start making your skeleton in the first place? So we're going to hit all those points. And then we will finish out by talking about the role of your skeleton in homeostasis. So specifically your skeleton is not only a thing that makes you not a mushy flesh bag gives you structure but it also provides a storage area for calcium so you can think of your skeleton as also your calcium bank where you make deposits and withdrawals into and out of it to meet your calcium needs so dynamic tissue just means that it's undergoing constant change Oh, I forgot the T. I got really excited about drawing that triangle. So uh, the delta symbol, which is the triangle, just means change. It's shorthand for change in science. Um, so that's what that means. So people think of the skeleton as being quote unquote finished at the end of adulthood. So after your growth plates seal up and you no longer get taller or bigger, people are like, oh yeah, it must be done. I don't think it probably changes after that. You would be incorrect. It's constantly changing. It's changing according to your activity level, how much heavy stuff you're carrying around, what gravity is like where you live, um, which is mostly the same for all of us, uh, and a bunch of other things. So we'll talk about that. You'll also notice from this picture that there are lots and lots of veins and arteries. Bone is super duper vascular. So it's although it is a solid, it's got passages running through it for blood vessels. Um, and that means that when you break a bone, there are steps to healing it that involve bleeding, a clot forming, that clot being replaced with other stuff, and then eventually you get actual crystallized bone moving into there. So we'll talk about that. So because it is so darn vascular, it receives about 5% of the total cardiac output, which is just so you know, we'll learn more about cardiac output next term, but uh, basically the milliliters of blood per minute that the heart pushes out. 
And that would be about 250 of those. So if you're not super familiar with metric liquid measurement, 250 milliliters is a quarter of a liter, and that's pretty good. Um, and this is at rest, so not when you're like sprinting down the block or whatever. All right, so functions of the skeletal system. I kind of hit these points already, but support is obviously one of them. So we attach muscles to our skeleton and attach flesh to those muscles and we wrap our, our organs in bones. So that gives us our shape. We have a body plan. We are not, as I said previously, a sort of land jellyfish where we're just a kind of a bag of cells. Um, that would be weird. We have bones. I mentioned the muscular attachment. So if you take two bones and you make them touch each other, and then you make a muscle go across from one bone to the other, when that muscle gets shorter, the joint's going to contract and get smaller. So that provides levers for muscles. So I'll just draw you a little model of that here. I don't know why it's deciding to make my little drawings wavy. That's irritating, but it is what it is. So a lever has two parts that move independently of each other and then a fulcrum where they meet, that's this. So if I attach a muscle here and then I attach it to the same bone down here, if this muscle gets shorter, nothing happens. It's just gonna pull on the bone for no reason. However, if I take this muscle here and I make it go across the fulcrum, like so, that means when the muscle gets shorter, it is going to pull this joint into a more acute angle. So that's what I mean when I say provides levers for muscles. It's literally what I just drew. There's also, you know, some very soft things that we need to protect. And a good way to protect them is to stick them in some kind of bony cage or prison. And this is important because it helps us keep them alive. So the cranium, oh, I don't have pink, huh? Okay. What about this? Nope. What I was trying to do was give you a pink marker so I could draw you a brain, but pink's not an option. So your brain sits in your cranium, which is a entirely enclosed sphere of bone yonder. Your brain's basically a wet computer and it has its own built-in helmet, which is your skull. The thorax contains obviously your two lungs and your heart and also a bunch of important tubes. So, but the, the heart and lungs are really sort of the highlights there. So heart and lungs. And then as we saw from the abdominal pelvic quadrants stuff, um, the thorax does partially protect some other organs as well. So uh, in the hypochondriac regions and the lumbar regions, there's a little bit of kidney, spleen and liver protection, but those organs are not completely covered. And then pelvis, this is mostly reproductive structures, uh, and also some of your viscera, so your intestines and whatnot. Hemopoiesis, um, so hemo means blood, and poiesis is just a fancy way to say the synthesis of from other materials. So hemopoiesis is I have stuff that wasn't blood before and I'm gonna make it into blood. Kind of like how flour, sugar, butter, water, and eggs are not separately cake, but if you combine them, they become cake. Same idea. So your hemopoietic tissues, the tissues of you that make your blood cells, live inside of your bones. So you might be able to mentally connect that by thinking about treatments for blood cancers like leukemia or other blood problems like aplastic anemia. Aplastic anemia is where you don't make any more new red blood cells. And so your oxygen carrying ability begins to diminish and then you don't live. So the treatment for those things is a bone marrow transplant. And if you've ever wondered like, why bone marrow? It's a blood thing, that's why. 
and also storage. So I mentioned that it's a calcium bank. So that's uh, sort of the primary function. And then phosphorus is a secondary. Um, so this is in the hydroxyapatite, which is the crystalline matrix that makes up bone. Um, hemopoiesis it takes place in the red marrow because it's blood. And then triglycerides, which is yellow marrow. This is just fat. And there's some changes as to like what proportion of your marrow is red versus yellow with adulthood. So we'll get into that as well. I really would like if this thing would go away, but I can't make it. I will look up a tutorial about how to do that later. Um, the reason is it's because it's in the way of some of my images and it's irritating me. Okay. So bone histology, what's present? And if you're looking at those images and you're like, that is not what I saw in the microscope, what are you on about? You're correct. It is absolutely not the same uh, level of complexity as what you saw in the microscope. This is a space filling model of the structure of the crystalline portion of bone. And if you're seeing the little square inset move, it's because you're coming on a short journey with me to the front door. Um, I did too good of a job filling up the wood stove and it is approximately one zillion degrees in here. So I'm trying to not die by dehydration. So you're just gonna come with me on a short trip to various openings for that reason. Oh my gosh. That's as far as that's going to go. Okay. And we're back to the couch. And I can watch the door also. So fun, quick fact, just for context. We have chipmunks here, lots of them. There is one in particular that I call Leatherface because I caught him eating another dead chipmunk recently. He was cannibalizing the other chipmunk who was already dead. Um, but that particular chipmunk really wants to come into my house. And if the door is open, he will try to come into my house. I don't know what his deal is. I don't know why he craves the flesh of his fellows and I don't know why he wants to be in my home, but it's kind of fun to watch him try and figure out how to get in. He probably does, honestly. <laughs> I'm just hoping I can befriend him and maybe convince him to go vegan. I don't know, we'll see. Okay, so let's look at this little question here, which is what's present. And specifically for this picture, we are talking about mostly stuff that's non-living. So if you're intimidated by this formula, please understand, I am showing you what's in this ionic compound. I am not going to make you memorize this formula and ask you it on a test. So the reason I'm being explicit about that is because some of you students, and this is true, this is going to be true for any group of students. So even if, you know, I'm talking directly to some people who were cool enough to try and show up to Discord. Thank you, by the way but I'm going to record this and put it on YouTube. So it's also going to end up being directed at students in the future. So hi, hi from the past. Um, what is important in deep learning, especially with really complex stuff like this, is a good solid working knowledge of how stuff works and why it works the way it does and what it's for. So that's going to be the focus of our lecture content both this term and next term. The reason I mention that is because some of you guys in your academic history, through no fault of your own, have experienced an overemphasis on rote memorization, where studying for you looked like making oodles of flashcards and writing lists and lists and lists and lists and memorizing and memorizing and memorizing. Um, and, you know, memorization is a good starting point, but if you really go turbo on the memorization and you don't ever make an effort to learn to apply or problem solve 
or uh, integrate the stuff that you're memorizing, then you're not going to do well on tests because those skills are also important and they get more and more important the further you go. So that scared me so much. I don't think you guys could hear that, but there is a high pitched sound outside, which I'm pretty sure was an elk screaming. Um, it's about to be elk mating season. So hopefully it was that and not a forest ghost. All right. So back to this, all that is just to say, over the course of this course and in your textbook, you're going to see stuff like this where it's going to make your eyes bug out and you'll be like, oh my God, there's a complicated chemistry thing. I don't remember chemistry very well and now I have to memorize this and it makes me feel anxiety and I don't like that. This is contextualizing information and providing additional context. It doesn't matter if you memorize the specific formula for this because that doesn't really tell you anything useful for you about why bone is the way it is or how it works or any other details. So I am showing you this because it's cool and for another reason that I'll explain in a little bit, but please do not look at these images and be like, I have to memorize every single part of that because you don't and it's also not a good use of your time. Okay, we also have collagen fibers in addition to this crystal. So hydroxyapatite is both a mineral and a crystal. So I bet you didn't know that you were partially made of crystals, but it's true. Uh, just not, you know, the kinds that people are trying to sell you on social media, different kind. And then collagen fibers, you guys know what these look like. They're pink, they're broad, You've seen many of them by now. So I'm going to put like in other connective tissue. And then there's going to be only about 2% bone cells. So bone is pretty acellular. The vast minority of the cells that you see are going to be making up the bulk of the tissue. So that's kind of the deal there. Okay, so... Here we have collagen fibers. So when you look at collagen fibers, they look mostly like some sort of fairly dense, thick, sometimes slightly squiggly lines, at least in an H&E stain. But if you look at the very tiny molecular structure of them, there is little subunits and those subunits polymerize to form a chain. And then procollagen is three of those wrap around each other. And that sort of assembles finally into a sealed ended collagen molecule. So this is one collagen molecule. And if you want to make a collagen fiber or fibril, you have to put lots of these together in this particular pattern, and then you have to put lots of them together in that particular pattern. So there's multiple levels of complexity, and this is what gives collagen its superpower, which is its strength and shear resistance. And then hydroxyapatite imparts rigidity. So the crystal makes it stiff and rigid and hard. The collagen makes it just bendy enough so that if your bone is strained, it's going to bend a little bit before it breaks. And that's important. We'll see why in a little bit. And you guys will learn more about what the bone cells do because we're gonna talk about calcium homeostasis, ossification, that's what the bone cell functions are. So if you're like, why did you skip that? It's because most of this PowerPoint is about that. So I mentioned spongy versus compact bone. So compact bone is osteons slash haversian systems. Remember those terms are interchangeable. And then spongy bone
is made of these ropey bars of bone called trabeculae. And most adult bones are a combo of both. So it's not like you have one kind of bones that is spongy only and you have another kind of bones that are compact only and never the twain shall meet. Rather, you have this very elegant structure where the compact bone forms the outer shell and the spongy bone forms the inner support scaffolding, but since it's not dense and solid, it is lower weight and density, and it has space for storage. So you can store red marrow in there, and that's what you use to make your blood cells, or you can store fat in there, and then you can use that fat in case of emergencies. You use your subcutaneous fat first. Your bone fat is kind of your break in case of emergency fat. Um, but nonetheless, you do have quite a bit of fat inside of your bones. So if you are a fully formed human, meaning that you are done growing, most of your fat lives in the medullary cavity, which is this space just kind of running down the middle of the bone. So if you were to cut this in the transverse plane and then look at the cut face, you would see something that looks roughly like that, where, let me draw some trabeculae here. Here's my incredibly detailed artistic rendering of the bone cross section. Aren't you impressed? So compact bone is this outer stuff, and then spongy bone is in the middle. Okay, so this is a long bone. This happens to be a femur, and the epiphysis, diaphysis, and metaphysis are all fancy special names for specific parts of long bones. So I'm going to show you those on this picture here. I wonder if I'm going to try something. It might not work. So if it doesn't work, I apologize in advance. In the old presenter view, you could zoom in on the pictures, which is what I'd like to do so I can access the bottom right corner of this image. But if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. No, how about laser pointer? Nope, I'm not allowed to zoom in anymore. What if I do this? Nope, these presenter tools are not cool. I don't like them. Okay. So the common form of long bones is that they're long. So you can see that they're just longer than they are wide. So this happens to be a femur. And I know that because I know that. Because I, I know all of the bones now. You will too very soon. So you will gain that power. The expanded ends, so you can see that the middle is kind of skinny and the ends here and here are wider. These are the epiphyses. So singular is epiphysis, plural is epiphyses. The central region, which is mostly a bony tube, is called the diaphysis, and it's shaped like a straw, basically. So in me, because I'm a fully blown adult somehow, someone let me be that, um, most of my diaphysis is full of fat. I don't really need the majority of my bone space for blood building anymore, but if you were a child or an adolescent, you'd have a lot more red marrow um, than I do. And then the metaphysis is the region that sort of joins the epiphysis. I'm going to estimate where the word metaphysis would be down here. It's probably like right about there. Um, this is basically, if you're wondering, why would you name that region of the bone? Like it doesn't look remarkable at all. It's just the spot where the one thing connects to the other thing. The answer to that is... That's where your growth plate used to be. So you used to have some hyaline cartilage right there that could expand so that you could grow your bones. Uh, but it's not present here because this is a fully formed bone. Okay, so this is something that you should be already familiar with from lab, um, where we have this nice little sort of cake slice Mmm, bone cake, uh, of basically the cut edge of a diaphysis of a long bone. 
And then we can see the outer edge is made of compact bone and that gives it incredible structural rigidity, which is awesome. And it also gives you lightness interiorly because it's not compact bone all the way through. So there's a lot of benefits to this um, arrangement of these two things. It's kind of analogous to how a surfboard is constructed. So surfboards are not solid wood, even if they appear to be. What a surfboard is, is wood or fiberglass wrapped around a foam core. So it's hard and you can stand on it, but the foam has trapped air cells in space and that's why it floats. So your bones are kind of along the same lines. I, I enjoy having a skeleton and also we have pretty significant normal forces on our planet because of how it spins, that, but that's what gravity is. And so if my skeleton was super heavy, I'd have a really hard time getting around. I'd have to spend a lot of calories and energy moving myself. So it's cool that I don't have bone that's solid all the way through because that means I can replace my blood. And it also means that moving is not so much of a chore. Okay, so if you're wondering what is that cartoon that is very silly, this is a cartoon image from a scientific journal uh, of cartoony representations of our bone cells and their various jobs. Um, so Discord folks who are watching this live, I'm gonna hit the pause button really quick because I need to take a sip of my beverage, my mouth is dry, and I see some grayed out options that I think I might be able to access if I hit the, the pause button. So I'm gonna see about that. So just one moment, resume. Okay, so what are these? They are bone cells. So if you think of your bones as a building, or a structure, which they are, there's going to be an outer solid area that, you know, just forms the boundary and provides rigidity. And then there's going to be edges that can be interacted with. So in this picture, we have, if you like look really carefully at the different sort of jobs that these little fellows are doing, what you're going to see is there's two classes. There are builders. and demolition guys. So that one, these dudes, this idiot. I like this one. He's my favorite because he's wearing sunglasses. And then we've got builders as well. So some of them are patching what's already there. Others of them are actually building the wall in the first place. And some of them are performing maintenance. And then finally, invariably due to actions like the action of this guy who is trying to kill the dude up here, sometimes bone cells don't make it, sometimes they die. Sometimes they do that by accident. Sometimes they do it on purpose in the form of apoptosis. Doesn't matter. We can't leave their little cell corpses lying around in our bones. So we have to have the cleanup crew, which is the cells responsible for dismantling the dead cells and getting rid of them. So there are immune cells in here as well. So that's kind of the three overarching categories for our bone cells. So let's get into that not cartoon form. So you guys have already seen a few of these, so I'm gonna try and go through them quickly just because this is not news to you, at least some of them aren't. So you might recognize this motif where there is a cell living inside a little hole in the bone matrix. So the cell is called an osteocyte. Osteo meaning bone, site meaning cell. And then let's talk about this word because you've seen this word before but I didn't necessarily explain the word form. So if you add the suffix iculus to the end of a word, what you're doing is saying, it's the little version of whatever the prefix is. So canaliculus means 
little bitty canal. And canaliculi means little bitty canals, plural. So these are just tiny bitty itty uh, canals in the matrix that the osteocyte sticks its little feet into. And then you can see that if you were to zoom in right here, which we already established that I can't because this is a terribly designed thing, you can see little seams here. So that's where one cell's foot ends and the other cell's foot begins. So what the osteocytes are doing is reaching out in these little canaliculi and they're doing a cellular fist bump to their neighbors. They're being like, what up, homie? Do you have any information to share with me? Do you have any ions? Do you have any fluid? What are you doing? How's your little home over there? So that's what the canaliculi, canaliculi are for. They're for osteocytes to communicate with each other. Now, we talked about the oocyte versus oblast naming scheme already, but just a friendly reminder, oblast is basically a baby version of an oocyte. So what that means is osteoblasts are immature bone cells. They're not totally grown up yet. They are secreting osteoid, which is bony precursor, and then that's being crystallized into matrix. But they're doing it from the edge. They're not fully ma mature yet. They're not surrounded by matrix all the way around. Osteoblasts will eventually become osteocytes, but they're not yet, so we call them osteoblasts. Osteoprogenitor cells. A progenitor is somebody who made you. So my direct progenitor is my dad and my mom, and then theirs are my grandparents, just as an example of how you use that. So osteoprogenitor means the creator of the osteoblasts and osteocytes. So these are stem cells whose divisions produce new osteoblasts, and these operate on the same principle as the stem cells in the stratum germinativum of the epidermis. So remember I showed you, I was like, this is, these are really cool because when they divide, they produce one daughter cell that stays a stem cell and the other daughter cell is like, yeah, I want to specialize in my career though. So I'm going to become a special cell. Same deal here. So with each division of this, one of them stays a stem cell and the other one becomes an osteoblast. Et voila, you have a constant supply of both. Okay, and then finally, these are my favorite ones because they're weird. So osteoclast with a C, not a B. This is one of those nasty times when two words that mean completely different things are only different by one letter. And I know how cruel that seems. Stop snoring. Sorry, my bulldog is snoring and I'm worried that it's getting into the audio. So, okay. Dogs with short faces make a lot of noise. So osteoclasts are really cool. Here's why. All of the other kinds of cells that I just talked about come from the same cell line, meaning that they have the same ancestry in stem cell history. And that stem cell history is, is bone-based. So they're specific to bones, they do bone stuff, whatever, blah, blah. And it makes sense because you're like, yeah, well, obviously a stem cell for bone would turn into bone cells. That's Pretty straightforward, Professor Howard. Why are you emphasizing it? Because what you're going to notice about osteoclasts is that they are big, giant cells. I'm going to draw a really, really large ones, so just bear with me. And I'm making it purple because I like purple. They're not actually purple. So first of all, they look like the Pac-Man ghosts or some kind of weird jellyfish. So they have a domed top and a ruffled border. And then second of all, they have lots and lots of nuclei. So most of the time when you look at a cell in histology, you're like, yeah, one nucleus per cell. That makes sense mostly. Um, there are exceptions, obviously. You saw some skeletal muscle, for example. But usually it's one nucleus per cell. Uh, not very many cells have only, uh, not many, very many cells have zero nucleus, and not very many cells have oodles of nuclei. So it's kind of fun when there's exceptions. So this is one of those exceptions. And what it looks like is it has a billion eyes and a bunch of tentacles, which makes it basically the Lovecraftian 
god Cthulhu, um, which is, I think actually you're correct. I, yeah. So if you don't know what we're talking about, uh, you can go read H.P. Lovecraft. Um, regardless, though, ancient beings, very scary. So scary, in fact, that when humans looked upon them, they were like, my brain doesn't get what that is. So I'm literally scared to death. Picture lots of eyes, lots of tentacles. That's all you really need to know. So that's what they look like, which is neat by itself. Also, if, if you do know the reference to H.P. Lovecraft and you're trying to remember osteoblast versus osteoclast, if you mentally associate Cthulhu, even though it's not totally accurate, as you pointed out, with osteoclast, you can just C and C. It's an easy way to remember. So these are cool. So they're not bone-based, so they don't come from the same, same stem cells as their friends over here. They're actually coming from the immune stem cell population. So they are crossovers. They're the black sheep of the immune cell family. They're like, I don't want to be a macrophage. I want to be something else. Hmm. And then how do they get all these nuclei? Well, What happens during the formation of osteoclasts is that a bunch of individual stem cells called myeloid stem cells come together and they merge Voltron style to form a megacell, which is why they have so many nuclei. And then that megacell grows tentacles, which is just about the coolest way of being a cell that I can imagine. So obviously I'm biased here, but like, it's really cool. Okay. So I mentioned the little cellular fist bump here. Unfortunately, this is more zoomed in. Um, I usually like to draw instead of making a slide that's just for the thing, but whatever, it's me. So if you were to zoom in on these little junctions here, what you would see is this. So friendly reminder about gap junctions, things you may have forgotten from Biology 160. A gap junction is basically just a little tunnel between two cells. So if I'm like a sodium ion over here and I'm like, well, I'd really prefer to be over here in this cell, I can go through one. That's fine. So we're going to talk about gap junctions a lot. Um, typical, typically, gap junctions are used to transmit electrical signals from one cell to another. So in biology, an electric current is when there's a cell membrane. So if this is in and this is out. An electrical current is when we have a mass influx or efflux of some particle that's charged. In this case, we're using positive ions, cations. So that's what electricity looks like in a cell, wet electricity. So when a cell wants to tell another cell like, hey, I'm doing electrical stuff, you should probably also do that it will often connect to its neighbor via gap junctions. So you saw that in the intercalated discs in the heart um, where those cells are electrically united. Same deal here. So if you're thinking to yourself like, why would bone cells want to communicate with each other electrically? That's real weird. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, good question, good wondering. Another person also wondered that very same thing. He was like, gap junctions? I wasn't expecting that. Why are those there? And that guy was named Dr. Wolf. So we're going to come back to this dude. We're not going to do it this video. Um, but if you look at human bone growth patterns and you basically look at a bunch of bones and you're like, okay, so all the bones that I'm seeing, regardless of who they came from or what that person's upbringing was, they have stuff in common. If you do that, you'll notice that the spongy bone has all these cool like lines and stuff. And in each person's bone, they're the same. So this guy was like, why is that? Why is everybody's bones like have this cool, unique core structure that's specific to humans and the same across humans. So 
this recording and video is already 40 minutes long. So that's going to be my cliffhanger is that I'm not going to answer that question for you right now. I'm going to make you wait until the next video so that you get to find out what gap junctions and this doctor dude have to do with each other. And that was actually an excellent production value on my part. Good job, me. Okay, so let's see what happens when I click stop.